So again, this panel is called The Brains. Smart TV functionality brings new content to HD and Ultra HD. Well, thank you for that. Uh, by the way, anybody here like dumb TV instead, hands? I, I didn't think so, so this is really a winner. Uh, I'm Pete Luday, pleasure to be here. I'm a consultant with Mission Rock Digital, based in San Francisco. My area of expertise is in engineering for content. I spent many years heading up the R&D labs within the Sony Corporation for the professional products, and now I'm working on a number of new standards, technologies, and ecosystems ranging from smart TV through ultra high definition, high dynamic range. So this is an area of great interest to me. We're uh, supplemented today by a fantastic panel of experts to share their wisdom with you today. We have Barbara Kraus, the uh, Director of Research for Parks Associates. Hello, Barbara. You can raise your hand. Well, we know who you are. Okay. <laughs> Matthew Durgan from uh, Smart TV uh, LG Electronics. <laughs> Thank you. That's what we need. Paul Sweeting, a principal from Concurrent Medium, Media Systems. And finally, Vishnu Rao, the director of product technology for uh, Sharp Electronics. Okay, very good. I'm going to ask each of our experts to provide a little bit of perspective and background to start out, then we'll get into panel discussion. And I'd like to leave some room for audience questions as well. So we'll work that out, start thinking about what you want to hear based on what we're going to be uh, talking about here. Barbara, if you could kick it off by giving us a little bit of context from your perspective at Parks. All right, good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm Barbara Krauss uh, with Parks Associates, and just to give you a little bit of uh, background on Parks Associates, we're a research firm. We specialize in the connected home. That includes everything from connected consumer electronics to smart home to connected health, and as well as a broadband, digital media, and access. Uh, my uh, particular uh, function is uh, connected uh, CE and platforms. But we've just um, finished some research on connected CE. And one thing, uh, I'm looking at the trends of smart TV as, as well as the challenges. One thing we've seen is that the rate of growth in consumer adoption of smart TVs is increasing. Uh, last year, 24% of US broadband households had a smart TV. This year, that's up to 34%. Uh, we, we show about 20% of households are in the market for a new flat panel TV this year. 71% of them are looking for a smart TV. That has grown dramatically as well. The year before, it was 62%. but Consumers are aware of them. They're looking to get them when they replace their flat panel TV. And we also see a lot of growth in the connection. Last year, 16% of households actually connected their smart TV. This year, it's up to 24%. And connection's a competitive market. We have um, streaming media devices, Google Chromecast, Roku, Apple TV. The single largest connected device is the gaming console. That's because it's a much more mature category. People are used to using it. They know how to use the interface. They have a comfort level with it. But a couple of things that we see interesting on the usage side is that people are using their smart TVs, their connected smart TVs a little bit differently. Uh, if you have both a smart TV and a gaming console, uh, consumers are a little more likely to use their smart TV to connect to the internet than they are the gaming console. That's a relatively new development. And uh, consumers are also using their smart TVs for a little bit differently. If you're a streaming media device, if you're a Roku, Apple TV, people primarily stream movies and TV shows. Uh, if your gaming console is actually YouTube, seems to be the most used um, app on that. But with smart TVs, the usage is a little more varied. Uh, certainly, they stream Netflix the most. They stream YouTube after that. But 40% of them uh, get on Facebook on their TVs. 
So not only are they streaming content, but they're using social media interactive content. So overall, the trends are, you know, again, their growth, usage, and varied usage, and those bode well for the smart TV. But if you look at cha challenges, uh, one of them is the interactivity. Uh, there are new revenue streams uh, as people use their smart TVs. Uh, advertising, content placement, and so forth. So manufacturers want consumers using their interface. Uh, the thing is, TV still remains a hobby. It's still a passive entertainment experience. If you want to buy something while you're watching TV, you could buy it on your TV, but at this point, uh, you're very likely to keep watching TV and do your e-commerce on your smartphone. So changing that passive experience to an interactive one will take some, I think, uh, education about the functionality available on smart TVs. And there's going to be a learning curve as people, uh, they're used to using mobile devices for that. Uh, so it's going to take some time for them to adapt. And the other challenge uh, smart TV has is can the hardware keep up with new platforms, new apps, and so forth. Uh, the hardware can run the risk of being obsolete uh, after a certain number of years. And at that point, consumers may not want to replace their TV. TV works great. It's just not up to date. At that point, we still think they'll go out and buy a streaming media player for $50 or $100 and get their content that way and use that interface. So the challenge there for the industry will be to have TVs that don't become obsolete before consumers are ready to replace their set. All right, Pete. Thank you very much, Barbara. Good information. And uh, I think we'd like to hear from some manufacturers now. So let's call up Matthew Durgan from um, LG Electronics in charge of uh, smart TV content. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so at LG, I think it's uh, it's pretty simple. We like to push the envelope with smart TV. We were the first uh, manufacturer to put Netflix into our devices. Uh, we were the first manufacturer to do motion remote. Um, and last year, we made an investment in WebOS. And what that does is it really allows the smart TV to be fully integrated into all the other content options that consumers have. So it can be a, an immersive experience. It can be a quick switching experience with a the first smart TV to allow true multitasking. So you can um, actually switch between a linear television experience to you know, an over-the-top provider. So you know, we continue to push the envelope with, uh, with smart TV. All right, very good. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, Vishnu, tell us what's going on with Sharp. Yeah, so at Sharp, um, you know, we're trying to simplify uh, the TV experience. We're looking at ease of use. Uh, we understand our consumers now have access to content from a variety of sources, whether it's live TV, cable satellite, or, or streaming channels. Uh, so you know, they're spending more time trying to find out their content. Uh, so we put together an experience uh, which allows consumers to quickly find and discover content uh, from these variety of sources, and even give them um, uh, viewing options as to where best to watch their content. In addition, uh, you know, we're looking at personalization uh, as a key element. Uh, you know, uh, cable and satellite, it's still very difficult to pull all Bruce Willis movies uh, that's running this week, uh, for me at least. Uh, so you know, how can I do that uh, in my household? Either it's action or it's kids and family. So how do I uh, create an experience just for my family out of uh, cable satellite, out of uh, streaming channels? Uh, well, Smart Central 3.0, which is our platform, allows you to customize your uh, your guide, whether it's over the top or whether it's coming through the wire uh, in, in, a, in a manner that matters to you most. The other part of uh, Smart that we are heavily investing in is the mobile application. We believe you know, most of our customers have either a tablet or a smartphone uh, next to them when they're watching TV. And sometimes they really want to see what's, what they want to watch next or discover more content while watching what they're watching today. 
So uh, our smart uh, platform on the mobile allows customers to have full access to their TV guide, full access to their streaming services. Uh, they can do global search. They can even control their set-top boxes right from their mobile application. And you know, in the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll be releasing voice control. We'll be releasing a lot of other capabilities, such as filtering by moods, by director, by year. So we, we are kind of uh, pushing the limits uh, on, on the mobile side because we believe there is a lot of opportunity there. All right, those are good perspectives. And Paul, what's your take on all this? Um, well, I've, I think it's important to distinguish between connected TVs and smart TVs. Um, connected TVs I would define as, as um, devices capable of, of connecting directly to the internet, but, but are, are um, primarily useful for simply accessing um, web-based programming sources, um, as opposed to more sophisticated smart TVs, which uh, are capable of, for instance, downloading and installing apps from, from other places and, and capable of sort of independent functionality that's distinct from simply accessing uh, program sources that you could access on your PC or your, or, or your tablet. So I, I think there's, there's sort of two different categories. And, and I think consumers have, have, have embraced the connected TV so far. Um, they like being able to get the additional content that they can access through Netflix and Hulu and YouTube and so forth directly on their TV. I'm not sure we, uh, the consumers have fully embraced the idea yet that, and I don't mean this as a criticism of any of the, the, the devices um, uh, my colleagues up here are, are manufacturing, but I'm not sure consumers have yet embraced the idea of the TV itself as a sort of independently functioning device. Um, <clears throat> you know, it took, it took Apple with the iPhone um, to train the mass market to expect uh, functionality in our phones um, that it was not really intrinsic to the phone itself as a communication device. I mean, we, we had had um, cell phones before, mobile phones before that were primarily for voice communication and text. text. BlackBerry taught us to expect email, but it was still essentially a communication device. And then Apple came along with the iPhone and taught us all and trained us, trained the mass market really to expect functionality in our phones that is not really intrinsic to the phone itself as, as we traditionally have thought of the, of the phone as a, as a device for communication. And I don't know that we've had that moment yet um, in, in the smart TV space where the mass market has said, aha, I want you know, independent functionality in my, in my big screen TV. I, I think it's, it's tricky. I, mean, I think it's a valid point. Um, you know, I was working at LG when we only had connected products. And you know, I think that's a good distinction. I think that you know, in the early days of this, you know, we pushed you know, the partners and, and all the connected devices were the same sold a million TVs and they all kind of had the same partners in there and uh, as long as you like those partners, you liked your connected TV. But what we did with smart TV was we introduced a lot more capabilities for the consumers to choose what content partners are going to matter to them. So, um, so when we see that distinction between, you know, pushing, you know, 10, 20 partners to consumers versus offering content choices to consumers. I think our belief is that consumers do want that. Um, they want that customization. They want the ability to make their TV customized to what they really care about. And, and first, a question on that. Uh, do we have a definitional problem as to exactly what a smart TV is? Even in this morning's panels, I noted that we seem to be using the term smart TV and connected TV sometimes interchangeably. Is it clear what the difference is, and how do we educate consumers on what that is? Well, it, it's not clear. I mean, there's, there's, I don't think there's ever been a great definition of it. But um, for LG, we believe that that transition was made when we introduced the ability for consumers to customize, to create their own accounts. Um, you know, to uh, you know, to be more interactive with the content and the user interface of the device. So we, we made that transition, and, and that's when we we moved from calling it a connected device to a, a smart device. So, so at Sharp, uh, you know, we a little bit more holistically. Uh, we believe that um, you know all TVs will become smart moving forward. So so the so the thought process is, what is the TV of the future? 
And what we believe is that you know, the cable industry, the satellite industry will continue to be there. Uh, at the same time, you'll have over-the-top services uh, kind of trying to get the same opportunity from the consumers. So for us, smart TV or connected TV is essentially the, the, the emergence of the traditional TV and over-the-top services together in a manner that can make sense to the consumers. They are able to find the content that they want. They're able to access the content that they want seamlessly from a single experience. So on that ground, one of the things we also heard this morning is the importance of over-the-top distribution for new content such as ultra-high definition and has not yet achieved full standardization for terrestrial broadcast or satellite. So in that regard, um, connected TVs or smart TVs that have connections obviously provide a big advantage. They allow you to see House of Cards in 4K on Netflix. However, um, such programming requires much more bandwidth than many homes have. A Netflix uh, advertises that uh, in their statistics, a typical Netflix user is accessing the service at less than three megabits per second. I think most would agree that that's inadequate for ultra high definition. How do we bridge that gap? How could we address the thirst for content in an environment where there's not enough bandwidth? And is, could that encumber the adoption of smart TVs if people are uh, limited in their available broadband? I don't think it will um, hurt the adoption rate so for a couple of reasons. One, I think people want smart TVs for the connection. I agree with you, there's connected, they're smart. I don't think the awareness is out there on what the difference is. Uh, that consumers really understand they can customize this, they can, make, they can personalize their TV set. But they do want smart uh, to connect to the OTT media. In some cases, you can, get, you can stream live TV. It opens up some options for them. It replaces a second box in their house. I also think that uh, the growth in TVs has been in the larger screen sizes, and most of those are going to be smart over time. It's to the benefit of the manufacturers to have an interface out there that people can interact with. And it is something that consumers want. Again, we saw almost three quarters of potential TV buyers that want a smart TV. Yeah, I also think that to, to some extent, <clears throat> um, the people who, f f from the perspective of the people who are doing the 4K streaming right now, 4K is something of a Trojan. Um, I think they, they're, they're taking advantage of <clears throat> And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, they're simply leveraging the, 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 um, the hunger, the thirst that, that um, uh, TV set makers have for 4K content to help sell their 4K TVs to, um, get, to embed technologies into those TVs that, are, that can then be used for, for other things. For instance, you know, 4K is going to, the interest in 4K streaming is going to drive um, you know, the adoption of native decoding of HEVC. Um, Google is pushing native decoding of v, uh, VP9. Um, at CES, they announced um, partnerships with a broad range of set makers and chip makers to, to embed VP9 decoding in the silicon. Um, and they were doing that, you know, they were, they were doing that uh, ostensibly um, in order to support um, 4K streaming, but of course you can use VP9 and HEVC for, for, for 1080p content or 720p content as well at a significant bandwidth savings. So I think a lot of it has to do with leveraging the interest in, 4, in getting 4K content onto TVs in order to embed these other um, technologies into connected TVs and smart TVs generally that can then be used for, for other things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, back to the original question. The, this technology has been the best technology. It's one of the great things about smart TV at bringing these formats to consumers you know, quickly, right? We were streaming 1080p before many of the set-top boxes did any 1080p. So it was really one of the best ways to get 1080p content to the device. Uh, we were doing 3D streaming you know, before you had you know, great um, traction with you know, physical formats on, uh, on 3D. And now we're, uh, you know, the first to deliver 4K, you know, content. So I think 
Uh, that's one of the best things about smart TV is its flexibility. You're not waiting for, uh, you know, a, a, you know, tens of millions of set-top boxes to be upgraded, or you're not waiting for a standards committee to create a new physical format and then decide whether or not it's it's valuable enough to distribute. You know, you're you're able to put that new uh, technology instantly to use, and and smart TV brings those new exciting display technologies into reality for uh, for consumers. So I think that's one of the best things about smart TV. So essentially, uh, you know, the way I look at it is smart is essentially future-proofing a product to a lot of extent because, you know, why do people go over the top? Because they want to have access to the content at any given time, wherever they are, uh, which our smart TVs actually allow consumers to do that. Uh, what would be even better if if there is no blurring between or there is a blurring between you know what's over the top and what's uh, on your cable and satellite, and the, and the third opportunity here is essentially uh, getting 4K. Now you know if I want to watch a movie, if it's available on 4K, I, I would love to watch it. And you know the applications and the pl uh, partner applications are smart enough to actually provide us with the optimal. Uh, content based on uh, the bandwidth in the house. If it is not available, it'll downgrade to the next available uh, resolution. So, uh, the 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 thing, the thought process from a consumer perspective is very less. They want to watch a content. They want to watch it at any given time and watch it very easily. And the quality would depend upon you know how well the house can hold. Uh, some of the, I think in the content community will worry though because. Um, Consumers may get their smart TV with ultra high definition capability, and they may uh, be enticed by the idea of 4K content over their OTT network. And they tune in and download and watch their Amazon and Vudu and, and Netflix. However, they're seeing it at 24 frames per second, they're seeing it at 8 bit, and they're seeing it highly compressed to 2 or 3 megabits per second. That may be uh, an experience which is not very well received, and people may come away with the impression that my smart TV does very bad ultra high definition television and make it more difficult in, in the education process. Do you think that's true? Uh, well, uh, not really in the sense that, you know, um, Sharp and, uh, and um, you know, other companies as well are investing heavily on upscaling technology. I mean, we believe that in, in the near term that is essentially, uh, and we have done a good job at it, good enough that, uh, you know, again, you know, in the previous panel we talked about the fact that you know the the ship is sailing. Uh, we are doing uh, great when it comes to upscaling technology. Uh, so you know consumers will get a great quality picture uh, through even through smart, um, and would even help other content providers to actually get onboarded on this. That's a that's a good point. By the way, if there's any questions in the audience, raise your hand and then yeah, go ahead, um, shout, and we'll repeat it if you, if you can hear. Uh, yes, I guess two parts. One is uh, you see any trends. So the first question is regarding video conferencing, H.265, will that have an impact? And secondly, is the combination of data with video content and what opportunities that would create? Any thoughts? Well, on the, f the first point, um, I think it's actually broader than video conferencing, actually. I think one of the real long-term upsides of, of getting intelligence into the, into the TV is live video, whether it's um, for conferencing purposes or, or essentially internet broadcasting of, of live content. And I think ultimately that's what Google is about, for instance, with, with the whole VP9 strategy. That's not really about 4K. That's about getting a, a high efficiency codec into the marketplace and deployed as rapidly as possible that can then be leveraged for um, delivering live content um, directly to the television without having to go through the traditional gatekeepers. Um, I, I think that's why, you know, rumors popped up about Google's interest or apparent interest in Twitch TV, for instance, which is a, a, a huge live phenomenon right now. Um, whether anything will come of that deal, I have no particular insight into, but it doesn't surprise me at all that they'd be interested in, in somebody who's already delivering live content, because I think that's what their strategy 
their long-term strategy is, is to build a beachhead that will allow them to get live content directly onto the TV without having to go through Comcast or DirecTV. And, and that's, uh, I think, a, the, the big long-term upside of, of, of uh, smart TV is that kind of new functionality. So at Sharp, um, you know, one of the things that we are trying to look at is um, HTML5. So we believe that standardization, to some extent, will help uh, help create uh, services like uh, like the web conferencing feature that you're talking about, even blending uh, data and video together with transparency. So again, it goes back to uh, what is the platform of choice, and, and of course, uh, how will that help uh, content providers or content creators to create these services uh, for this product? Yeah, question up here. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm saying to Arande with Arande Media, a technologist filmmaker, the question I have is, how do you have a process that engages what you're creating with the consumer? So you have some sort of a, 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 a interaction. So the question is, uh, does smart TV enable interaction between content creators and consumers? Yeah. Well, uh, we have a great example of that, actually. Um, we launched an interactive experience with Showtime, where while you're watching you know, many of the Showtime shows, overlaid on the screen uh, are interactive elements that are actually um, created, maintained, encouraged by Showtime's network, Showtime networks themselves. Um, so they're building communities of Dexter fans, uh, Penny Dreadful, and, and these, uh, you know, these, these shows that are, that are hit shows now you have the ability to watch it with interactivity with all the other legions of fans of those shows. So, uh, you know, so that technology is very exciting, and, that, and uh, that's another area where LG has been very innovative um, to bring more value to consumers because of smart TV. And, and is that proven to be more effective or equivalent to second screen interactivity, which has been getting popular last year? That's a good years? question. No, actually. Um, you know, I have to be careful because I don't want to. I don't want to speak on behalf of Showtime, uh, but uh, but they've been very pleased. And comparatively, uh, they believe that the smart TV on-screen interactivity uh, has actually performed better. So I think that uh, I think you know the the first start with that has actually been very positive for uh, you know for LG and for Showtime and for consumers. Very good. Uh, question over here. I think that's an excellent, excellent point. I think we should just yeah, just to re repeat that. the question for those that didn't hear. Uh, sometimes uh, an experience like Netflix is difficult on today's TVs. How could we improve the user experience? So, um, so basically, uh, um, in initially I spoke about uh, smart central mobile application. So that exactly the concept there is, um, you know, I'm watching something and I, I want to now find and discover something else. Uh, so our, our shop's smart central mobile application allows you to actually uh, do a global search on your mobile application. Uh, you know, we, right now we include Hulu Plus, we include Vudu, Cinema Now, YouTube, and we're adding more and more partners. But the, the concept is you look for what you want. Uh, it actually gives you, um, say you're looking for Die Hard, and you know, where is it available? It'll give you, uh, these are the viewing options you have. It might be even coming on your cable and satellite box. Um, and it'll give you right up top. It'll give you a synopsis, it'll give you uh, actors, director information, everything you want. And at that point, when you click on it, it actually starts the content right uh, from, from the let go. So you don't have to actually start an application on the TV, you don't have to search for it, you don't have to go to it and start it. You do everything on your mobile and it's very quick. And all you do is you, you, you turn on the content right off the bat. But that's the yeah, it's available now. But that's being done on a mobile device. It's mobile. Yeah, so... Uh, Interacting with your smart TV. Exactly. So, so that's one way to look at it. The other way is, again, global search on the TV. So we, are, we have already have that as well. So we, you have the same experience on the TV. Uh, but going back to the point where you don't want to disrupt what you're watching. Uh, or or you, you just want to... You have two or three people in the, in the household and everybody wants to do their own thing. 
um, you know, that you can still do it on the mobile side, not disrupting the TV side. And Paul, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I think that it's an excellent point, excellent question, and it brings up a sort of broader issue I, <clears throat> that I think is is a problem for the for the industry, and that is that it, to some extent Moore's law ought to solve that problem, right? You get you know more processing cheaper into the into the devices. The problem for set maker, TV makers is that TVs don't iterate very well. I mean, the replacement cycle is much longer than than it is for smartphones, for instance. So smartphones, the iteration cycle can kind of keep up with Moore's law as, as, a, as you can get more processing power in, people buy new phones. And, and um, so Moore's law is sort of attenuated in, uh, in televisions because of the, the longer replacement cycle. That's why I think a, you know, another big, uh, uh, a, a, a critical functionality for, for smart TV makers is to make sure that their, their devices can, in, can engage with mobile ecosystems because that's, that's where the iteration is going to happen that's going to allow the sort of functionality, s seamless functionality that you're talking about. Not always. Yeah, well, we've had universal search for four years. Um, it's not, it, it's not quite what you're talking about. I think you're you're going broader than just searching for terms, uh, searching for movies. But um, you know, but the iteration is a good point. Um, four years of of universal search. It's it's effort. We take our content from all of our all of our partners. We ingest it in a centralized server so that people can hit that server and and find uh, find what they're looking for quickly. I think it's uh, it's critical to provide that experience to consumers uh, because as you get more content options, you want to go to one place to find uh, find what you're looking for. But it strikes me one of the things. I mean, what makes a smartphone smart or a tablet or a laptop is that it has a lot of processing power. It has very sophisticated CPUs, ARM processors, i7s. It also has storage, and it also has things like GPS receivers and accelerometers and cameras and microphones. That could add quite a bit of of cost to the bill of materials of a television set. Do you think consumers will be up for spending two or three hundred dollars more? for the additional processing power, will they understand the benefits? When you come back though, if your TV is no longer up to date, it's so much cheaper just to get another device. Uh, the other devices, uh, streaming media devices, uh, Roku in particular has been working with Netflix to load faster, uh, be easier to use, easier to uh, download. <coughs> Uh, they're small, they're nimble, they're inexpensive, they can get new functionality and uh, new innovation to market very fast. And again, they're $50 to $100. Uh, so if you look at, do you want to spend $300 more, say for a smart TV that has the additional processing power, additional memory and so forth, I think there would have to be a real cost benefit message put out why is it better for me to spend $300 on this TV versus buying a $50 device when this goes out of date? Or, or will it already be in my gaming console, my DVD player, my remote storage, or my mobile device exactly. that provides yeah. that intelligence? So I think it's really an ecosystem in the living room that involves all these things. And uh, consumers, they connect more than one device. Uh, the average we show now is about 1.6, but that depends very much on... There's no device out there right now that has all the content, you know, the best user experience. Uh, consumers will start connecting a single device when it fulfills all of those needs. So, so again, I, I think one thing about the $300, I'm not sure where the data came from, but, uh, but I, I don't believe that's that high. Uh, and secondly, I think, you know, consumers are placing their TVs on, on the wall, on, Mm -hmm. They're making the, 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 the flat panel, the aesthetics becomes very important. And now you, you, know you have these boxes lying around. I think that's one reason why, you know, again, uh, the, our, plat our platform is much better than what it was last year, and we continue to invest in making our processes faster. Uh, most of our software is cloud-based. 
so all the computation is done on the cloud, so there is less stress on the, on the TV side. Uh, of course, we are uh, also investing on the mobile side uh, to complement the experience. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's the, the integrated experience, the fact that you turn on the TV, you have access to your cable satellite uh, system, you have access to your, uh, your Blu-ray players, you have access to your Xboxes, you have access to over-the-top uh, streaming services, all in one uh, experience with a single remote is what you know, consumers are looking for. Well, it's, it's a good point. So maybe our smart TV also includes a smart cloud in order to be able to do that. I think we had a question up front here. Yes. Yes, uh, Anthony Wood, the CEO of Roku, was quoted at a conference recently saying that he thought or he wanted the Roku platform to be the operating system of TVs and that he was in talks with several manufacturers to make this happen. So I just wanted the, the panel's thoughts on how viable this is, how realistic, and uh, given the fact that Roku has just a large install base all over and it would potentially speed up the adoption of smart TVs in general. Well, I already talked a little bit about WebOS, so you know where LG stands. I think there are going to be smart TV manufacturers that might consider those options. Um, but at LG, I think you know, what we're trying to do uh, with the WebOS platform, bring that simplicity, um, bring that perfect UI, not just for you know, the over-the-top content partners that are on smart TV, but to really blend all of your content options into one user experience that can be instantly switched between them. Uh, and if you, if, you know, if you haven't experienced this, you know, we have a booth uh, tomorrow and I think, you, I think you know, it'd be great to, uh, to try this out because it's the next level of smart TV when you can go instantly uh, switching from HDMI 1 to Netflix, back to YouTube, and then over to you know, HDMI 2. And, uh, and you haven't seen that on a smart TV yet, so I think it's a good idea if you check that out. Well, um, not, not a criticism of, of LG, uh, but... Um, I, I'm not. I think it's very much an open question whether or not TV smart TVs are going to have their own OS, or whether ultimately they become an extension of the mobile one of the one or all of the mobile OSs. Um, because from a certainly from a content creator's perspective and and a, and a developer's perspective, I'd rather have it. Uh, I'd rather, you know, have it an ex, be an extension of. I'd rather have the television be an extension of it of of an OS I'm already developing for. Um, and I can simply port what I'm doing over, to, not simply, but, but at least can, in principle, port what I'm doing over to the television. Um, if televisions end up, if smart TVs end up with their own operating system, let alone uh, multiple operating systems, whether, you know, including web OS and a Roku system, that's a problem for content owners and developers and, and for consumers, I think, ultimately. So I, I think it's an open question whether there's going to be a native OS of, of television or whether television becomes an extension of Android, iOS, Microsoft. I think Vishnu's point about HTML5, I think that's the unifying technology. Yeah, so, so we moved our platform to HTML5 uh, a couple of years ago. That solves a lot of the problem. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we, we see our consumers, our, our, our consumers being our content providers, actually uh, quickly creating applications for our platform. Uh, and even on the mobile side, you know, we are pretty agnostic uh, from a second screen perspective. So we have an application for iOS as well as Android. So, uh, you know, we, we try to... Uh, Stick, stick with standardization because I think that's where the return on investment is for our content providers. A uh, question towards the back there. So what's the barrier currently for a small and vertical content provider to get into these So what's the barrier for small content providers to get to these smart TVs? Yes. Mm -hmm. There is none. You can contact me. I mean, I, I, <laughs> Just put it, you, have to, you have to put it on YouTube, otherwise you can't see it. No, you know I what the barrier, the barrier is? The barrier is the same barrier that has, has faced American and global, global businesses ever since the beginning of time. It's, smart TV doesn't solve the fact that you still need a marketing plan, you still need to be you know, funded, you still need to have a good uh, solution for consumers, right? It's, it's awareness, not right. availability. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a magic pill that says, I don't have to be a good business person, it's, it's basically just another opportunity. <laughs> Um, yeah, question. To jump off this question, um, how do we get entrepreneurs' investment to fund the applications and the services that, as Bart was saying, people will embrace smart TVs? Should they go to Kickstarter or Indiegogo to get crowdfunding? Should the TV set makers join entrepreneurs in going to the venture capitalists, the angel investors, the incubators and accelerators, like Y Combinator and 500 startups that have yet to really embrace television? 
the way they've embraced the web, they've embraced smartphone apps, they've embraced tablet apps. What, what can be done to get entrepreneurs the funding to uh, make smart TV apps happen? So how do we get developers to embrace smart TVs like they have smartphones <laughs> for applications? Part, part of it to me is just um, a question earlier, what's it take for smaller developers to get on the interfaces? Part of it's eyeballs. Uh, you want apps on your TV or whatever device that people are, you're, you're going to have enough people using to make it pay off. Uh, to get these apps on uh, TVs, there are a variety of funding uh, mechanisms that they can use, but I think the critical piece is to be able to convince the manufacturers that there is something, in a sense, game-changing here. Uh, something that's worth me taking a look at, something that's worth putting on my interface. And if it's just another app that's similar to everything else out there, I think it's more difficult. Uh, I see it as being a game changer or some type of disruptor uh, as a way to make both investors and manufacturers sit up and take notice. Mm -hmm. Standardization would also help a lot. I mean, if it, you know, if you can get an installed base of standards and you have economies of scale and then investment will chase the opportunity. Difficult to create a different app for every manufacturer. Exactly. Well, that's because the story of the eyeballs. That's the story of Smart TV Alliance, right? So we, we you know we joined up with other smart TV manufacturers. We have set standards. Here's, here's some DRMs, some codecs, HTML5, uh, some APIs which are going to be common across all the Smart TV Alliance manufacturers. So you can in, you can build that application and know that you know you're gonna you're gonna have you know really a lot in common with everyone that's in the smart TV alliance. Of course, there's always going to be you know things that you might do to tweak it for this manufacturer, that manufacturer. You know, but the bulk of the work has to be solved, and I think that's you know that's the smart TV alliance story. I mean, all I can say is that you know uh, from for the entrepreneurs, we haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to smart TV opportunities. I mean. Think about think about a day and age where you know displays are everywhere, pretty much every, in every wall because it's so cheap. Uh, you bring so many different options. Uh, a good example is you know uh, our wallpaper mode. Uh, you know when the TV is turned off, uh, there is a great opportunity right there. You know what do we show when the TV is turned off? So basically, Sharp created an interface where uh, consumers can actually see their album art. Uh, and, and, and you know now take that and make it a smaller screen size, put it in your uh, in your uh, in your room or your other living spaces, uh, and there is a lot of opportunities when it comes to data and video uh, meshed together. So lots of good opportunities, and that's a good way to close out our session. We are out of time, but please join me in thanking our terrific panel: Barbara, Matthew, Paul, Vishnu.